Thank you for being here today. My name is Diane Camacho and I own DLC Consulting Services and we support solo and small law firms across the country in areas such as law firm startups, operational assessments, billing and bookkeeping, anywhere that there are operational issues that need to be streamlined or improved, we can come in and help with that. So today I'm going to talk about the 10 foolish ways that law firms lose big money. And this is basically based on my experience and my team's experience working with well over 100 law firms across the country and 35 years in the business. So let's get started. The 10 foolish ways are decision paralysis, keeping unproductive or caustic employing, employees, hiring when employees tell you to, knowingly, unknowingly subsidizing lateral partners, not understanding firm numbers, ineffective marketing spend, trust accounting, not customized, customizing software, skimping on training, and not changing a, a bad decision quickly. So when we talk about decision paralysis, we know what decision paralysis is. You've got so much information coming in that you can't, you just can't make a decision. And there's so many other things going on that you can't make this one decision. So the causes of decision paralysis are insecurity, distrust, perfectionism, perfectionism, too many options and stress usually. And when you're a leader in a law firm, you're making decisions all the time, every day. You're making decisions whether you should place this ad or people could wear jeans or whether you want to be remote. There's just all kinds of decisions that you need to make and you need to make them quickly. And it's very rare that one of the decisions you're making is going to cause the firm to go under. It's very rare that a decision is a bet the firm decision. It's normally something that needs to be made in a timely manner and something that needs to be addressed, but it isn't something that has to be addressed right this minute. And it isn't going to have the effect of putting your business out of putting you out of business. So when we're talking about having to make a decision and you're you're kind of insecure and you don't really trust the, the information that you're being given. Maybe you want it to be perfect and you're afraid that you're going to make the wrong decision. Maybe you've got just too many options. You know, people are just giving you, oh, you can do this or this or this or this. And you need to kind of narrow the options down. And when we're, ha when we're under a lot of stress, it affects our ability to make decisions. It's known fact when our, we're under stress, our mind doesn't work the way it should. We forget things and it's hard to make decisions. So what I recommend is that you have a vision and goal and then you associate the decision you're making to that vision and goal. And a vision and goal doesn't have to be a long drawn out process that takes two weeks to do in a seminar over the weekend. It's really where do you want your firm to go? What do you want to achieve? And you can do this as a group, you can do this as a leader, however you want to do this. And then when you've got your vision and goals, then you can say, okay, does this support my vision? Does it support my goals and values? Can I afford it? Is it going to improve product, product? Is it going to improve profitability or culture? And what happens if you don't do it? So there's a lot of time we waste on discussions and meetings and then, oh, well, let's, let's get that information and we'll talk about it at the next meeting and asking for another op opinion and, and, oh, let me talk to some friends and let, you know, if you can't decide, put it off. Say, we're going to table this for two months. We're going to table this for 30 days and move on to something else that you can make a decision about. When you don't make decisions and things are just kind of flailing along and things need to happen and you're taking a long time and everybody knows you're chewing on it, and it just, it isn't good for morale. It isn't good for you personally, and it's not good for the firm. So if you say, okay, I'm going to, I need to have these three things in order to make a decision and I want them by the next meeting and then I will make a decision 30 days after that. So you can put that out of your brain. Stop having it have real estate in your stress brain. 
Another thing that is really costly is keeping unproductive or caustic employees. And, you know, causes are, you know, you're, you're afraid. If that person has been here for 25 years and they know everything, what's going to happen when we let that person go? Who's going to do that job? Are they going to know what to do? All of this fear around having somebody, normally it's a, a normally it's a long-term employee that kind of becomes this person, either evolves into a disgruntled employee or maybe is not keeping up with the times. You want to make a change in the firm and that person really is causing roadblocks to those changes. But you have loyalty to that person. They've been with you for a long time. They're part of your family. This is a small firm. You're not Elon Musk who just fires everybody and moves to Texas. So you have a loyalty to those people and, and you want to be liked. You want to be um, respected and you want the people that work with you to like you. And the company culture is we don't let people go. And if they've been here a long time, then then we can't let them go. So there's a lot of reasons why you might not. One of the one of the ways that you can work with this or or uh, address this is you know it starts with good job descriptions that can evolve with the time. If, if you're if you're looking at your job descriptions, and a lot of people don't really have job descriptions, and it's they're not really that difficult to put together if you just sit down and do it. And they should really support the vision and the goals of the firm. Again, if you know where your firm is going and you want to have a growth mentality or you want to be on the cutting edge of technology, you need to have people in your firm that can support that. So you want to have characteristics and skills that can support the 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 changes and the evolution of your firm. You want the person to have growth opportunities and they don't need to be, they start out as a receptionist and become an attorney. It could be they are learning new things or they become the, um, the expert on the new software or in some way they personally grow. So there should be growth opportunities in there. They should be consistent. If you have a if you have a paralegal job description, it should be the same job description unless you have very clear junior paralegal and senior paralegal, or unless there are skills and abilities in there that somebody can grow into so that you're using the same consistent job description. And they need to be realistic. So you can't expect people to you know, be available 24 seven, you know, I've seen that on resumes that that's just not, I mean, on job descriptions, that's just not realistic. You need to be realistic and you need to be very clear. And then there should be things on there about good citizenship. It should be somebody that can work with a team, somebody that has a positive attitude, somebody that uh, works well with others, is adaptable to change. Those kinds of things should also be on your job descriptions so that they can carry you through these types of changes. And then when you're having a problem with an employee, you can go back to the job description and you say, you know, this is something that we really need to have is somebody of with the ability to change and have a positive attitude about that change and how can we make that happen. If you are in a situation where there is somebody that has been there for a very long time and really isn't keeping up, really isn't making it, there are ways for you to help that person monetarily with maybe helping them find another job. Sometimes they should be retired. They're at 65 or 68 and they really should be retired. They're having a hard time keeping up and helping them by maybe paying their medical for a period of time or something, being creative with the package that you give them when they leave. Of course, it has to be fair and equitable and all of that kind of thing, but you really should be looking at ways either to help that person improve or to help that person with the next phase of their journey. Hiring when your employees tell you to. This is when everybody's coming in saying, oh, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. I need help, I just am so busy. That isn't necessarily when you want to hire. When you do this, it's oftentimes because 
everybody looks busy, you're busy, you're working 70, 80 hours as the owner of the firm or the manager of the firm, and you're busy, you're not really sure what people are doing with their time. They are kind of looking, again, they look busy, but you're not sure if they are producing what they need to produce. This is more difficult, of course, with folks that aren't billable, or if you're doing flat fee, and you don't know how long something should take. So you can't really monitor the number of estate plans that are being delivered or the, you know, number of widgets they're producing. I, I can't think of anything else, but so it's, it's hard for you to quantify what they're doing. You don't want to lose anybody. Oh gosh, if I, if I say to them, they need to improve or they need to increase their productivity, maybe they'll leave and that's going to be a problem. And, you know, putting your trust in people saying, well, I trust the employees that are coming to me saying that they're really busy. So I need to hire somebody. Well, you need to be very clear about when you make the commitment to add another person to your firm. And in the 80s, the big thing was you just throw another person at it. You just throw another person at it. But as we've had to operate in a more lean manner with less resources and oftentimes a lot more, a lot more pushback from clients as far as price points, we have to be more cautious about just throwing a person at this problem. You have to understand what they're going to be doing, what is being done at your firm. If you're not looking at the productivity of your employees, then you need to figure out how to do that. Whether it's comparing output, whether it's looking at the types of things that they're getting from attorneys, if they're uh, legal assistance, you know, how many phone calls are still coming in, those kinds of things. You have to, you kind of have to back it up with data and you have to figure out what the data is and then identify whether you really need somebody or not. Another thing that we have found multiple times that is really detrimental to firms in a lot of different ways, not only financially, but also with the respect and trust of partners is having a lateral partner come into the office and say, we're going to give you 40% of what you collect or 30% of what you collect. Sounds like a good deal. Sounds like the firm is going to get 70% of what this person collects. That sounds like a deal. It's not going to cost us more than that, right? Well, you need to really think long and hard about bringing in a lateral partner and how you're going to vet that partner. Some considerations. How long were they at the last firm? If they've been a, at a firm for three years, then another firm for three years, and they're looking again, that's, that's a problem cycle. It's not the firm, probably. It's that they have made commitments that they cannot fulfill. And they, the firm finds out about it after about a year, year and a half. They start coaching, trying to get them to get it, and then they say, you know, you got to leave. It's not working. You have to understand what their billable hour rates are and then what their collection rates are. So if they're billing at $500 an hour, but they're only collecting 70% of their billings, their collection rate is definitely not $500 an hour. And then you have to look at the cost of their practice. If you're bringing in an IP attorney, they're going to need special software, special calendaring, all these different things. You have to understand the cost of that person's practice. And then being enough for them may not be enough for the firm. So having them collect $100,000 might be fine, but if the firm is only getting $200,000, that may not be enough to pay for the costs of them and make a profit. You might be subsidizing that $100,000 for them. And you have to remember you're running a business. This is, you know, it may be a good friend, you really like them, you trust them, it's going to be great. You're running a business. Normally those things don't turn out so great. So let's look at some of these numbers. So say we, we decide that we're going to give a partner and one associate, you're going to bring them in and you're going to give the partner 30% of the collections and you're going to pay the salary of the associate. And the partner says, okay, so I'm working 1400, my associate's 1200, these are our hourly rates. So that billable amount is 1.2 and you're like, oh, okay. So they'll get 378. 
we'll get about $900,000 off of that. That sounds great. We're in. And then reality hits. And you have the reality of the actual average billable rate for the partner is actually $400. And she only billed 1,200 hours in the year, not the 1,400. And then the associate, their billable rate really is is 300, that's what they're collecting, $300 an hour. And they're billing only a thousand hours. So the value of their billable hours is $750,000. And then they write down money. So they write down 10%. So now they've billed $675,000 and they're collecting 85% of it in the first 90 days. You have to assume if you haven't collected your money in 90 days, you're not going to. Any money you collect after 90 days is a bonus. Just remember that. If you're into collections, you want to collect it as quickly as possible. That's why end of the year collections are not a good idea. So anyway, so you've collected in uh, $573,750. A third for them is... 172,000, which is great. That's that's a fair salary for them. They're very happy with it. But the firm 75 to 70% is only $401,000. And then you have the salary and benefits and 401k of the associate, which is 145,000. So the firm profit is 256,000. This doesn't include the cost of the IT or any kind of other services. Maybe there's a legal assistant helping them. Maybe they're using paralegal time and the paralegals are very busy. It doesn't include the rent, supplies, nothing else. So you come out looking at this going, hmm, this isn't such a good deal. We certainly didn't get the 880,000 we expected. So be very careful when you're bringing on lateral partners and really understand what the finances are for them, what their revenue rate has been, what their billing rate has been. Don't go by what they give you. They give you a spreadsheet with some information. You want to look at the actual reports from the previous firm if possible. And then you might want to say, well, we're going to do this for one year. You don't make a long-term commitment. The other thing that's really expensive is really not understanding your numbers. And what we just talked about is an example of that. Not understanding the numbers for that particular partner and the associate has now cost your firm money. You thought it was going to be 800 and now you're getting whatever it was, 200 and something. So not understanding the statistics and firm numbers can be very detrimental. And when I'm talking about firm numbers, I'm talking about the realization rate for your cases and employees. So the realization rate can be two different things. It can be the number of hours billed versus the number of hours collected. That can be the realization rate. Or it could be the number of hours worked versus collected. So either billed versus collected or worked versus collected. So it doesn't matter which one you do. You just need to do one consistently and understand what the realization rate is and what you want it to be. And then you want to know what the utilization rate is of billers. And this is an asterisk because you need to understand what you are hiring for. So if you don't know what the utilization rate is of your billers, you certainly don't want to hire anybody until you're clear about that. The firm's operating ratio. How much money, <clears throat> how much money does it cost you to earn a dollar? That's your operating ratio. Very easy, it's your expenses over your gross and then your operating ratio. And it's nice to have uh, a 50%. You know, you make 50 cents on the dollar. That's great. Sometimes it's more like 30%. It just depends on the cost of your practice and how you spend your money. You also want to know what the dollar amount is on your write-offs when you're at billing. You should be looking at that every month. In large firms, you can't write anything off without it being approved by somebody, whether it's the head of accounting or it's the head of your practice group or it's a partner or somebody, you can't just write off time. And in small firms, we find that people just write off time. Associates write off their time. It, it's kind of a free-for-all. And 
sometimes you don't need to write off time. We worked for a client and they, when we were doing the, uh, the assessment, we noticed that they were writing off a lot of time for an associate. So I went into the partner and I said, why are you writing off Sam's time? It's, is, is there a problem? Is he not doing well? It, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, he's new. So we write off his time. I said, he's been here for nine months. They didn't realize he had been there that long and they continued to write off his time. Well, he's not new anymore. And that's why they're at the lower billing rate. And that's why you expect them to take longer to do things than you do. So be very careful again about writing off time. You're giving money away. <clears throat> I do it though, so I can't really say anything about that. And what's happening with your AR over 90 days? Like I said earlier, you might as well kiss it goodbye if it's over 90 days, unless it's a contingency case or it's a, a trust administration or probate. There are cases where you might have expenses out longer than 90 days because that's the nature of that particular case. It should not be the nature of that particular client. You should be collecting your money before it hits 90 days. You also should know what it costs for each employee, not just their salary. So when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the cost of a so uh, software. I'm talking about if they're an associate, are they going to have support? Do you need to buy office furniture? You know, what is the complete cost of that employee? So that you know, okay, so if that employee is X amount of dollars, this is what it costs for that employee, and you can bring it down to the hourly rate. So you know that it costs me $70.84 for this legal assistant. And now you know what the profitability is on that person if they're, if they're billing or if you're splitting that cost amongst other people. Understand the full cost of each employee. And understand the expense categories on your general ledger on your profit and loss. This is really hard. You know, when we're looking at and evaluating finances for firms and they have a fir uh, they have a category that says consultants, I don't know if that's the attorney, the CPA, the IT person, somebody like me, a management consultant, maybe it's a coach. You want to have enough breakdown in your profit and loss so that you can isolate and identify what you're spending your money on. So you want to have IT, but you want to have software, you want to have hardware, and you want to have services. So you see what you're spending your money on when you need to make decisions about cutting services or adding services or adding a person. The other thing that's important to know is your cash position. So your cash position is basically, how much money do I have in the bank? What do I need to pay this week? Do I have enough money for it? I do that. I try to do this weekly. It's something that a lot of firms don't do. And it's one of those things that really can help you sleep at night. Because what we worry about as business owners is if we're going to have enough money for salaries, if we're going to have enough money for that 401k deposit. So having an idea of really where your cash is, then that's going to be helpful. The other thing that's helpful is knowing when your monthly breaking point is. If it costs you $250,000 to run the firm every month, when you hit that number, you can say, okay, I can, I can relax a little bit. I've paid for the cost of this firm for this month. It's just another way to understand what's going on and have comfort in the finance. The next thing is ineffective marketing spend. There are a lot of people, marketing companies, that are selling to law firms a monthly subscription. And they're selling this saying that we're going to do A, B, C, and D. We're going to, you know, do your ROI. We're going to check your keywords. We're going to give you a bunch of reports. We're going to make sure you have so many leads. All of these different things. So you're thinking, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. And then you talk to them at the end of the month. And they say, yeah, we got you 7,000 leads. And you're like, oh, good. Okay, so that's great. But you don't really see any increase in income. This is where you need to understand the return on your investment. And this is where you have to track it. If you're paying for marketing, you need to track your marketing. So let's look at this just real quick here. So uh, how much are you spending on your marketing? 
So you're spending $1,000 a month. And how many leads are you, and you can also be paying for that, how many leads are you getting? So you're getting 25 leads. Where did they come from? Did they come from this marketing campaign? Or did they come from referrals? Or did they come from past clients? Or, you know, where are they coming from? Are they coming from this marketing spend? And then you say, well, how many new clients did I get? Well, I got two clients and my average value of a client is $2,000. You know that because you know how many clients you made had last year and you know how much money you made and you divided it and that's your average salary, average client or however you want to figure it out. So how many of them are good clients? Are they clients that you want? Are they at least $2,000? Are they $5,000? Are they $1,000? You know, are they the good clients, the people you want to work with? So if you've got two clients at a value of $2,000 and you spent $1,000 for those two, then it was $500 per client. Only you can decide if spending $500 is worth a $2,000 client. That's, that's up to you depending on how much it costs for you to support this client. If it costs you $1,000 to support this client and you're making $500 and you're spending $500 per client, maybe maybe that not so much. So you need to understand all your numbers to start working this. Another issue is trust accounting. And I can talk for hours about trust accounting and I'm not going to talk about it here. Basically, correcting and fixing your trust accounting is very expensive. If you're not doing it right, you can get disbarred, you can get fined. Figure out your trust accounting and have somebody that knows what they're doing help you. Another thing is not customizing your software. So customizing your software is really important. And now with what's coming out in the market, it's more important, it's more important than, than ever because they give you basically a shell and they say, okay, well, we can create custom fields. Well, if you don't know what the custom field is for, you don't know that the custom field is so that you can track where you got that client from as a lead, or it's a custom field adding the client's birth date if you're an estate planning attorney or whatever it is. They just say, okay, you can do this and you can do that. And then they send you some videos. Some of them are better than others, but you have to customize your software. And it may take time to roll out the entire software package. Don't think that on the first day you have to roll out the entire software package. It's advisable you don't, in my opinion, and my advice is roll out the necessary pieces, the billing, the time entry, the calendaring and when you get into the special features roll those out more slowly so customization ideas docketing this is the program that calculates the number of days from the trigger date of a court case so if a trigger is motion for summary judgment you got it filed you got it served yesterday how was it served it will calculate the days for your reply and response a lot of people are still using their Outlook calendar and they're still basically counting days. You don't have to do that anymore. It's not expensive anymore. Automation. Automation is when you have a system where you've entered the information. So you've entered the name and the address and the birth date and the uh, cost of the deal or whatever. And then you have a document that merges that information into the document. It merges the information into a lease or into a sales agreement or, or whatever you're doing. A estate planning attorneys understand this like nobody else because they've been doing this for a very long time. They've been spending a lot of money on it, but that's what automation is. Macros are tools that allow you to create something the same way. So it's a macro for a letter. And maybe it puts the client's name in there, but basically it sets it up so everything looks and feels the same every time you do it. So you start from scratch, scratch every time you do a macro. So that's kind of the difference between automation and macros. They, they can be blended. Remember when you're deciding on your software, 
you need to understand what you want to get out of your software. So you want to say, okay, I, I need this report. I need this information about my mailing list for my holiday cards, you know, whatever it is. You have to understand what you need to get out of your software in order to decide how you want to put information in. So be very clear about what the uses are of this data. A lot of times we get, oh, this is a really pretty software. Well, it's pretty when you're entering your time, but that's not really what, what really drives the firm. And it's always nice to be able to put information in one place and have it flow to all the different pieces of the software. That's great, but that should not be the deciding factor. The next thing is skimping on training. So one of the things that we think is that we can learn things, we're smart, we can learn things on the fly, we, you know, we have smart people, we don't really need the training. It's very short-sighted. Training relatively is inexpensive. It's training can cost, you know, a hundred to two hundred fifty dollars an hour. And if you're looking at this, an employee is doing something the long way and it takes an extra minute to complete it and they're doing it five times a day, that's 20 hours of value. And if this is an associate that you've just flushed down 20 hours of their time, when you could have, even at the 250 rate, you could have got them trained. Software changes, you have to keep up with it. And you have to train attorneys and staff on what they do, not what the trainer thinks they should be doing, not what the software thinks they should be doing. So training tips, train with new software when it's implemented. So you do the initial training and then train again three months later on the same software. Maybe you're introducing another feature. Maybe you're introducing the workflow feature or you're introducing the tasks feature, something that's, you know, you're adding on to what it is and you're refreshing. And then train again in six months on the same software. You need to have training consistently budgeted and planned through the year. Software changes all the time. We don't know it. All of a sudden we open Outlook and it looks different because they've changed it and made it so much better for us. That happened with QuickBooks recently. We can't keep up. Nobody can keep up. So you need to be able to understand that you have to have training over and over again. And you want to make sure that you know in your firm who is a quote super user. Who is the person that knows how to use this software in and out because they ask the right questions. They are the most prolific. So they are, they're the person that does the most variety of things. It's not the managing partner that all they do is enter their time. It's the legal assistant or the paralegal or the younger associate that is trying to maximize the features of the software and have those people more than one, the kind of super users. So people can get together and ask them questions as a group or just send them an email. Don't pay for an attorney to sit in a classroom. I think this is the biggest waste of money. They don't pay attention. There might be, you know, one or two that want the full hour. They want to sit there and they want to know everything that the software can do. But usually they're looking at their phone. They're correcting their pre-bills. They're modifying a brief. They are not paying attention. Believe me, I have trained enough to know. Do not force your attorneys and your billers into a training that is one uh, that is in a classroom with a bunch of people. Get them one-on-one -on -one training. What I suggest is that you not only have somebody train before the software is rolled out, but you have somebody on the floor physically in your office the day of rollout at least. Depending on the size of your firm and the complexity of the software, it could be three days, it could be a week if they're helping you with your finance and billing and things like that. And those people go around and sit down with an attorney and say, tell me about what you do in a day. And if all they're doing is emails and time and they just want to make sure they know how to save their emails into the document management system, that's what you show them. Their assistants and other associates and other attorneys are going to show them how to do other things. But when you are rolling out new software, just train attorneys on what they need to do. And do it, if you can, one-on-one -on -one in their office in front of their computer on their system so that you are tagging the things that are on their homepage as you're doing it. Tell me what cases you're working on right now. 
and you tag them and they're on their homepage. It's done. You're not training them on how to do it. They're never going to remember. And then have quick tips. Have it at staff meetings, firm meetings, whatever. Have somebody say, hey, I learned this and hand out maybe a quick tip card or have a little video and show the quick tip or, you know, whatever. But always have a, a culture of learning and improving your skills. And that pretty much is the creative culture where people want to share what they've just learned. Also, have good new hire training. It should be consistent. It should be documented. It should be, we want them to be able to create a motion from the template. Check mark. We want them to be able to do the report on their own time. Check mark. You have to be consistent. It has to be documented. And don't rush it. Don't rush it. You know, give them the time, you know, how to enter their time their first day and how to find matters their first day. And then, you know, three days later, four days later, a week later, sit down and show them the program and spend time training them. Training is so important. We spend so much money on software and then we don't do the training and it's a waste. And not changing a bad decision quickly. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you've purchased software and you're in it and you need to figure out how to make it work. But many decisions can be rolled back. The decision of reducing PTO time and giving another holiday or combining sick and vacation into PTO time and reducing the number of days and a, a, a person can take off. Those are huge decisions for your employees that can be rolled back. Don't feel like I made the decision and that's what it's gonna be. You can't be rolled over. You can't just be, you know, uh, uh, make the changes because one person complained. But if it's a bad decision, you may wanna think about whether you wanna change that decision. And it may need to be January of next year. So when you're making decisions, stop, reassess, try something different. What's the goal? If the goal is to save money and you've reduced benefits and people are leaving, that was a bad decision. Thank you for watching this video. I hope it was of value. Reach out to us if you need help with any of your operational issues in your law firm. We're DLC Consulting Services and we provide a 30-minute free consultation. Please reach out to us and schedule one today. Thank you.